side. They just get more and more excited to have our scraps after the meal and they're putting on a whole show about that. Um, the eggs that you get from them, of course, it feels good to, to collect your own eggs and eat those fresh eggs from your chickens. They're the best eggs. Um, the, my most favorite reason to have chickens is that they're recyclers. They take all of our food scraps and put them to use. So nothing is ever wasted. They eat all of our food scraps and they recycle them into eggs. But even more importantly to me with that nutrient cycling, they take all our food scraps and turn them into manure, which goes into our compost, which then cycles back into our garden and helps new things grow. Um, and so that, that recycling, on-site recycling, you know, nutrients going from our food through the chickens back into the garden, new things growing, um, is the, to me the most important reason to have chickens. Um, and then of course weeds, our chickens eat all our weeds. Um, they love anything green. And so no matter what weeds we pull out of our garden, they are always happy to devour them for us. Um, okay, we're going over to Gail for what do we need for chicks? Okay, well, the first thing to, to look at is where to buy chicks. And there's a couple different ways to do that. You can buy them online, which a lot of people do, and they actually hatch them and put them in a box and mail them to you. And then local feed stores will carry them as well. Um, when to get chicks, uh, there's two trains of thought. Um, they, they hatch usually starting in March and go up until October. The hatcheries hatch from March to October. And it's kind of interesting because they don't know exactly when they'll stop hatching in October or November. It really depends on nature. Uh, even though they have controlled environments for hatching chicks, nature takes control and one day the hatchery will call our feed store and say, no more chicks. They didn't hatch this week. And so um, it's anywhere between March and, and October. Some people like to get them first thing in the spring and then raise them all summer. Um, and and that works because you've got nice warm weather all, all year all year until they become young pullets in the fall. I prefer personally to raise them in the fall because um, I keep them warm and they usually start laying about six months old. And so that way I'm not raising them all summer and then they quit laying or if they don't even start laying in the fall and then they start laying again in the spring. So it just depends on what your schedule is. A lot of people don't want them in the summer because they take a lot of work and you're on vacation. So um, the types of chicks that we recommend, you know, people kind of go all over the place. Like John was saying, he used to, and, and me too, used to buy the pencil neck, this and the fancy that and the you know all these odd odd varieties because it's fun you look out in your yard and every single chicken is a different flavor and type but um, a lot of people once you've had them for a long time kind of settle down to some of the basic layers and that's because they're pretty dependable and they're laying they're dependable in their sort of the personalities that they have and their um, how quiet they are and that sort of thing um, let's see, uh, one thing I want to note when you're buying chicks is there's, there's two things that you see if you're buying them online or when you're buying them in a store, it'll say either that they're sexed or that they, it's a straight run. And a lot of people get caught their first time buying chicks. They say, I bought a straight run chicks. Well, unfortunately, straight run means that you end up with a whole bunch of roosters. Um, basically they everybody's hatched out and they just throw them all in a box and you get them. And roosters, as much as I love them, they're really fun, they're beautiful, and they're, but they're very loud and they're not allowed in the city. And so that opens up a whole can of worms on what you're going to do with five or six extra roosters. So um, for most people, they prefer sexed chicks. And those even then there's a 10% chance of rooster and we're going to talk a little bit about that is what you do with a rooster when you get them if you don't live out in the country. Uh, the other thing to note is that we do have a disease um, around here that's called Merix that shows up in chickens and so I always 
recommend uh, buying chicks that are vaccinated for Marix because it's it's just a devastating disease and it's it's easy to get them vaccinated and it doesn't cost that much. So I usually suggest that. Should I keep going, Amy? Yep, chick care, okay. Um, chick care, uh, when, they're, when you get them, generally, if you get them in the mail, they were hatched the night before, they throw them in a box and they mail them to you and you get them the next day. And so the first thing I, I have people do when they get them in the mail is to give them electrolytes and get them warm right away. Uh, and then they, as soon as they get water and they start scratching around and eating their food, um, at the feed store, we get them and we give them electrolytes to kind of give them a boost and get them warmed up really quickly. And within a few minutes, they're scratching around and, and doing well. Um, in terms of transitioning, I can't remember what we were talking about that, but basically um, they need to be kept warm. That's the biggest thing with chicks. Warm, 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 warm. They you know, if you can imagine that the, in there, if they were out with a hen, they'd be sitting underneath her and it's about 98 degrees. So they need to start off at 98 degrees. And we can talk a little bit more about that. The, in the old days, when my grandfather was a chicken farmer, you just, everybody fed whatever chicken food there was. Nowadays, we've, you know, narrowed down the science to where we actually have baby food, chick food. And so that's what we usually start them with. Um, people ask me all the time, is, is medicated better than unmedicated? We tend to not use medicated unless you really have to. Uh, and for the most part, we haven't had to in about 10 years. So um, I prefer not to use medicated food because it just adds extra um, antibiotics to the system that you don't need and you want to save that for when you really, really need it. So um, as they grow, they start feathering out. It's amazing how fast they grow. Uh, they, you know, within a few days, they've got feathers on their wings and within a week, they've got feathers all over. And within two weeks, they're, they're little, little tiny chicks like the front of this book. You can see the second picture down. Those are probably two week old chicks. They grow in, in, in exponential form. And eventually you start moving them outside in a protected environment and they can, um, you know, start learning to be outside and scratching around. Eventually, and I have a, a sheet that John has, a, which is kind of, I call my cheat sheet on raising chicks. That's really helpful. It tells you about when they can start going outside and about when you can actually get them out into your coop. And, um, and in terms of the hens, once they're outside, we have um, our chicks. We were lucky enough to have a hen that decided to sit on eggs. And usually that's really an annoying thing because they stop laying when they sit on eggs. And if you don't have a rooster, you're not gonna have chicks anyway. And so you're, you just, um, you end up uh, with, <laughs> with a hen who's just sitting there being ornery and fighting everybody because she's got her babies that aren't really babies. Well, in this case, this hen decided that it was okay that if we put chicks under her. So we bought day old chicks and stuffed them underneath her and she decided to, to be a mother to them. And that was pretty wonderful. And those chicks are about um, six weeks old and she's got them outside already and scratching around and having a great time uh, learning to be hens. Um, in terms of hen care, uh, the biggest thing I think f for me with hens and chickens is just keeping them safe. It's so hard around in this area. Uh, we let them out to scratch around and literally we have to stand over the top of them because, because some wild animals uh, will come and take them. And so uh, when it says pasture, it, it depends on where you are. You know, if you're, if you're in a uh, predator less area, you're, you're lucky. A lot of people can let them out in their backyards. Um, 
where I live, I actually have to have them uh, in a big, big coop with a roof on it and fencing that goes down into the ground because things dig under and dig through and everything else. So um, taking care of hens, that's the, the biggest thing when you're talking, and we're going to talk about building coops later, but the biggest thing is uh, keeping them safe. And that's, I always recommend to think really, really hard about that before you get your babies um, so that you're prepared. Um, in terms of feed and supplements, um, the feed these days, if you buy a really good food, it's, it's got everything that they need. They add calcium for their egg strength. They, uh, there's a food um, that has, and most foods have some diatomaceous earth for natural warming in them. They have chrysanthemum flower ground up inside there for their egg yolk quality. And they just, I mean, they really thought a lot about chicken feeds these days. It used to be just old, you know, stuff they swept off the floor and thrown into a bag and said, here's your chicken feed. These days it's actually a really scientific um, formulation for your hens. So just picking a good one. It comes in non-organic and, and then now we've got GMO free food and then we also have organic food. And in terms of supplements, um, my favorite supplement for chickens is uh, sunflower seed, black oil sunflower seed. My grandfather was a chicken farmer and he grew fields and fields of black oil sunflower seed um, because he felt that that was um, contributed to their reproductive health. And from my uh, observations over the years, I haven't found anything scientific to back it up, but from observations, it's really helped a lot um, in terms of um, keeping them healthy in their egg production. And then water, water is always a challenge. You know, I tell people they can go without food for days, but they can't go without water for an hour. So you really need to think about water and how it's, go how it's, um, presented to them. Sometimes some people just put out big tubs, some people have fancy waterers, and it, it kind of depends on your situation and, and um, what you can provide for them. And I think my time's up, John. Great. Mm -hmm. Gail, um, no. for folks that need this info, what would you say in brief about heat lamps with the chicks? Uh, heat lamps. Um, it depends on the time of year. Usually I recommend one of the kind of lamps that has a ceramic base so that when you plug in a light bulb, it doesn't get overheated. And that's what we usually start with. It's a, it's a regular heat shade lamp. We sell them at the store. Most stores sell them. And then it comes with a 250 watt bulb. And what we have done is we have a two foot tall baby box uh, for the babies and it's two feet tall with a lamp on top and we found that with that 250 watt bulb at two feet tall it's exactly the right temperature for the first week and then each week um, after that we start raising the bulbs or changing them out to lighter bulbs or tipping them up so that we can slowly reduce the temperature. Yeah, and I've noticed um, when I've raised chicks and I have a light, you know, I'll just hang any kind of, you know, 100 watt light bulb in the little box that they're in. And I'll notice that they'll either cluster together right under the light, or if they don't want as much heat, sometimes they'll slide over and, and they'll self-regulate. But I always kind of start so they have a lot of heat so they can take it if they want it when they're babies and they don't have their feathers yet. But yeah. that, I figure that's important. And, and at times I've raise them outdoors and I've just run an extension cord and put a light in mm -hmm. in the outdoor coop that I'm raising them. Um, okay. Someone did have a question, Gail, and I don't know if this is easy to answer or not, but cost per chick per week for organic feed. Um, um, <laughs> hard one. <laughs> that is a hard one. I mean, uh, you can get organic feed uh, 30, it's $33 for 50 pounds, generally speaking. And one little chick will eat a tiny little handful. So you can kind of figure out, uh, a lot of people will buy just a five pound bag. And I would say probably 
10 chicks would go through that five pound bag in a week. If that makes sense. You know, yeah. What about chickens? Like if you had five chickens, I have six chickens and I go through a 50 pound bag a month, a month and a half, mm -hmm. but we also feed them a lot of compost. That's about right. Usually it's, um, I have lots of chickens. I have 50 chickens. <laughs> so we go through about a bag a week. But if you, you know, bear it down, that's about right. About a month, a month and a half for a sack of feed. Yeah. You're supplementing with other things too. Um, one of the things that I always, you know, tell people to be careful about is they, they say, but the chickens love, they don't love their pellets or their crumbles as much as they love the snacks. And I said, well, it's just like, like little kids, you know, or, or anybody else who, who, who wouldn't rather eat ice cream um, than, than their, and you have to be careful not to overfeed them the, the snack stuff. Scraps are f totally fine, but I'm talking about the snacks that people buy. We have a lot of people that come in and buy mealworms, dried mealworms, and um, like suet blocks and all those kind of fun stuff that are good for hens, but not exclusive. They really need their balanced diet. Yeah, you know, someone asked about buying older chicks that might be, could like skip the heat lamp and just get them out to pasture or outdoors. Is it possible to buy older chicks or, or grown yes. chickens? Yes, it is. it is. Um, <laughs> sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, it is possible. Uh, a lot of times the feed stores, the people are on vacation right now and the feed stores will have chicks that are have been around for a while we've had some sometimes it'll be seven or eight weeks old before somebody comes and and sees them and buys them the other thing is that you can there are also small farmers who will raise hens uh, or what we call pullets or young hens up to a certain age and you can go buy them and that's usually right before they're ready to lay those are a little harder to find but you can find them. Nice, good to know. Yeah. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which is um, about housing your hens. And Amy's gonna talk about this. Yeah, great. So on the most basic level, what we need is a hen house where they spend the night and where they lay their eggs. And we need a run where they spend their days. Um, there's so many ways this can look and as you're gonna see in a second We're gonna have a video that's a tour of John's chicken coop at home And we're gonna have a video that's a tour of my chicken coop at home and they look pretty different um, So there's there's so many designs um, but the The most important things you can have in your hen house are that it's enclosed for warmth that it has a roost bar They like to to sleep on a on a, a bar and that it has nest boxes just some cozy spaces where they can go to lay eggs and you don't need to have one nest box per chicken, they tend to share. Um, all my chickens use one nest box and ignore the other nest box completely. Um, the hen house is the most important space to be completely predator proof. Um, the run is the space where they're gonna spend their, most of their daytime hours, although they need access to the hen house as well so that they can go lay their eggs. Um, but the run, people make different decisions about how much predator proofing to invest in for their run. Um, I like my run to be 100% predator proof so that the, the door between the hen house and the run stays open 24 seven. Um, and then the hens just put themselves in the house at night. Um, I do have friends who have a, a, run, a run that is not predator proof. So then they have to physically go out there every night right when it turns dark and close the door to the hen house. And then they also have to get up when the chickens get up to open that door to let the chickens out into their run. Um, and so if, you're, if your run is not, is not predator proof, it's just more work um, letting the chickens in and out kind of on their schedule. They're not gonna be happy if they're cooped up in their, if they're cooped up, um, in their hen house when it's daylight hours. Um, so I actually have a two run system at my house. I have a fully predator proof run that they always have access to, that the door is always open from their house into the run. And then 
at one point I had enough chickens that I felt like that wasn't quite enough space. So um, we do open that door into a bigger chicken yard for them to go into in the day. Um, and that space is not predator proof. But they really do have enough space in the predator proof run that when we go away for the weekend, they're fine just being in that, that run. And then we don't have to have anyone come over and let them in and, or let them out and put them back in. Um, and, it, you know, before dark, it is kind of challenging to get them to go back into where you want them. But that's when I bring all the food scraps I've collected all day, throw them into their predator proof run and they go right in and I close the door and they're good for the night. Um, so predator proofing is the number one most important thing. And I'll say this in the video too and show you some of the predator proofing things um, about my coop. Um, but I can't tell you how many people have told me we used to have chickens. And then they tell that same sad story about how predators got their chickens. Um, predator proofing, it should just be your complete focus in your design of your coop. Um, even down to, um, um, you always want to predator proof every side of your coop, the sides, the top, and the bottom. And the bottom, I think, is where some people miss. Um, that bottom should be as fully wired as the sides and the top. Um, and I actually recommend the wire that you use um, on the sides that you dig down around your coop and extend that wire well down underneath the soil because lots of um, pests like to tunnel under your coop. And I learned this the hard way on my coop. I wish I had done that. And now I have um, some resident rodents that like to tunnel under the predator proof floor of my coop. They can't get up into the coop because of the wire but they like to make their tunnels under there so that they can catch any food scraps that might fall through the wire, which is a little bit annoying. Um, so predator proofing, most important, pest proofing, bury that wire deep all around the coop to keep the pests out and make sure that when you're predator proofing that you think about rodents when you, when you um, design how snugly everything joins when you're predator proofing, because that'll keep out the predators and the pests. Um, Chickens like to be located where there's some sun and some shade. Um, and, and then when you see um, the tours of our coops, you'll see lots of features that make them just very easy to use for the people taking care of the chickens. And that's something that you definitely want to think about in any chicken coop design as well. Um, let's see those videos, John. Okay, I'm going to start with yours here. This is Amy's chicken coop. To the chicken coop at my house. Um, this chicken coop we've had here for several years and it works great in a lot of ways. So I'm going to share about um, how to make it secure for predators and pests, um, how to provide what the hens need here, and how to make it super user-friendly for people caring for the hens, and then a couple things about location and materials. Um, so predator proofness is the most important thing to consider when you're planning a chicken coop design. Um, and as you can see, we have um, not only our wooden chicken house, but we have a predator-proof run attached to the house um, with this wire called hardware cloth. It's a lot more um, secure and it lasts a lot longer than what's called chicken wire, which can degrade over time and get holes in it. Um, so hardware cloth is very recommended, and the predator-proof run has the hardware cloth wire across the entire bottom as well. Um, you can't see it because it's underneath some dirt, but it's there and keeps predators and pests from tunneling up and into the chicken run. Now, right now, I have the door of the run open, and the chickens can also go out in this other yard back here so that they can scratch around um, in the daytime. But at night, I always, always close them in to the predator-proof part of the run. And what I'll do is just throw some food in their box and then they'll go in and get it and I'll close the door. And then they're safe from predators overnight. So for the chickens themselves, um, what we need here is a, a warm, cozy chicken house with a roost and some nest boxes. And so here we are in their house and this roost, this pole up here above their heads is where they sleep at night. Um, and here are their nest boxes, which you can have um, fewer nest boxes than you have hens because they tend to share. Um, and let's see, also their run. So they have the predator-proof run 
which is kind of on the small side, so that's why we let them out into this bigger yard if we're home during the day only. Um, but if we go away for a weekend, then they still have this predator-proof run that they can be in um, and be safe all weekend without anyone coming to visit and let them in and out. The last thing to consider when building this is that the hens need both shade and sun. The more um, sun they have, the more eggs they'll lay. And so you can see our roof of our coop is made from sun tough, which is a clear plastic tough roofing material. For the people caring for the hens, what's important is that you have easy access to everything you need to be able to take care of the hens. So our nest boxes are out here on the outside of the coop and we can just lift the door and check for eggs. Similarly, we can just open this door here and access the food and the water from the outside of the coop. Now notice both the food and water are elevated, super important. The water's on about three pavers and the food is hanging. That saves you a lot of cleaning poop out of their food and water. Um, so we can access those from outside the coop also, we can access cleaning from outside the coop. Inside their hen house, um, underneath the roost is where they're going to deposit the most poop. So you want to be able to reach that easily from outside the coop. Um, and here I have linoleum on the floor of this part, and so I can easily take like a paint scraper and just scrape all the poo into a bin and throw it right in the compost. Super easy. And it's at waist height, so it's not like you have to bend down or crawl in anywhere. I like to not have to go into the run to do any of these things because going into the run is a great way to get a bunch of spider webs in your hair. Lastly, just a couple of other considerations. We located our coop uh, kind of in the far corner of our yard because chickens do tend to talk a lot, especially first thing in the morning after they lay an egg. They like to tell the world about it. Um, and so we don't want to locate it right outside a bedroom window or anything like that. Um, and then lastly, um, the materials that we use to make this coop, the hardware cloth, like I mentioned before, we had to purchase, um, and the sun tough roofing, and a couple of two by fours. But other than that, I was able to find all this used siding and other used materials just on free cycle or whatever I had around in my garage. Um, felt good to be able to, to reuse and recycle to build the coop. Thanks for touring. All right, thanks, Amy. So I'm going to queue up uh, my video, similar ideas. I once did not have a predator proof run and that's when I found possums chewing on my baby chickens. And now I have a predator proof run and my chicken coop is uh, very easy to maintain and care. And um, I don't want to have to in the middle of the night think about like, oh, my chickens. Um, so I really, really recommend a predator proof run if you have the ability to make one. Um, so here is my chicken coop. This is my chicken coop, mostly built with found wood. You can find the design for it at lifelab.org slash chicken coop design. And when we placed it, we originally placed it by the side of the house for easy access for composting and collecting eggs, but we noticed that there was too much shade, so we moved it into a sunny spot. It doesn't take up much room at all. The number one feature when designing a coop is ease of access for everything. Underneath my nest box here, I have storage for wood shavings or it fits a straw bale if needed. Eggs are very easily accessed here. And as you see, the chickens only lay in one nest box. The other nest box are used for storage. And I could also place food in through the nest box on the far left if I wanted to. Keeping predators out of your run and coop is very important. I use chicken wire around my coop. Some people put it underneath their floors as well. You also can see I have a small door that keeps my coop closed when I need it to be closed. My roof props open, which allows for me to add bedding materials easily. Bedding materials I use are leaf litter from my garden, or sometimes I use straw or wood shavings. My feed hopper has a vent pipe that's slid on top of it and it allows me to add a 50 pound bag of food to their feeder. When it's time to clean out the bottom of my coop, like right now, the side of my coop has a pop open door that allows me to access their manure and litter and pull it out into my compost zone. 
My door is just a simple flap of chicken wire that I pull off the frame and I've learned over the years that if you are going to access your coop, make sure the inside of your run is as tall as you are so you don't have to lean over all the time. You can see that the bottom of the coop has wire or hardware cloth and I use a piece of linoleum and sometimes cardboard to line the bottom of my bed and so when I want to clean it out I just slide out the linoleum and cardboard or I scrape it out with a small tool. One of the main reasons we have chickens is to feed them our kitchen scraps. We throw our compost in their coop daily through this convenient easy access flap. They recycle our kitchen scraps into eggs and we scoop out this area of their coop which is mixed with compost and their manure uh, once a year and put it around our fruit trees. It is a great system. And to continue with the theme of keeping things easy, we have an auto waterer. This is one that self fills, but they are kind of tricky to set. So I actually just have this connected to a battery powered timer that fills it daily. And we can go away for long stretches of time and our chickens are fine. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that tour, John. Um, yeah. And I think we are ready to move on to the Q&A. I think I've got number one, cost of feed compared to buying eggs. Um, <laughs> you're never going to get rich uh, with chickens. And <laughs> they're always going to cost more than buying eggs in the grocery store. However, there's a whole lot of other aspects to having chickens, the composting and the, and just also there's just something beautiful about going out into your backyard and picking up eggs and knowing what they've eaten and how they've been raised and, and um, it, it's just a, it's, it, it's an intri intrinsic thing rather than a money thing. So. Cost of feed runs anywhere from $15 for 50 pounds to $33 for organic feed. Um, some people do sell their eggs and that um, helps to mitigate some of the cost as well. Thank you. Um, I just got a new question that popped up here. Trimming dew claws from hens, can you do it? Um, in, in my experience, some some hens' nails overgrow and you end up needing to trim them very similar to dog toenails. Um, and other hens never need their toenails trimmed. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean by dew claws. They, they may be talking about the spur that comes out here. Some breeds will grow a, a big spur and some will not. Oh yeah, there she said, yeah, the spur. Um, you, can, you can trim it. Uh, you can blunt it off so that it's not sharp, and that's perfectly fine. I usually, if I'm going to trim anything, just like a dog toenail, just starts with a very small amount at the end and and just clip off the, the minimum amount that you need. But if they get too long, some, some chickens, they get too long and they start impeding how they're able to walk, especially some of the feather-footed breeds. They have a hard time walking because their spurs get too long and you can trim them off and you just do a little bit at a time. Great. Thanks, Gail. Mm -hmm. um, the second question we've gotten from you all, uh, the best breeds for first time chicken owners and the quietest breed for the city. Um, the local feed stores, when they, when they get chicks, they tend to get the, the best basic backyard layers. Um, and so if what you're looking for is the best laying flock, um, those are good ones to go with. Those tend to be like the barred rocks and the Rhode Island reds and the Americanas and Wyandots and Brahmas. Those, those are some, some standard feed store chicks. And those also, I looked up, after I saw this question, I looked up um, an article about the quietest breeds and all those that I just said are also um, listed in the article I looked up as some of the quietest. Um, breed. So I'm going to say it again, Bard Rock, Americana, Rhode Island Red, Wyandotte, Brahma. Um, uh, but 
oh, they're all probably going to talk when, especially when they lay eggs. Um, chickens do do like to make some noise, but unlike roosters, they don't start at four a.m. The hens the hens are quieter. You can too keep them locked up a little bit later in the morning too. There's nothing wrong with not wanting to wake your neighbors up at 6 a.m. by keeping them in their house for the night. And then when you're, it's time to get them up, you can let them out and that's okay too. Great. And number three is how could I feed them a balanced diet with kitchen scraps and grazing the land? Well, uh, I always recommend having a sack of uh, balanced feed handy. I've done a lot of chicken rescue type things and um, chicken adoption from free range farms and that sort of thing. And if you want really, really, um, really, really healthy chickens, you need to supplement them with a complete imbalanced diet as well as grazing and as well as kitchen scraps. That's just my opinion. And from what I've seen, I've seen even the healthiest free ranging chickens um, have had issues with their egg production. Chickens put out a lot of energy and uh, laying eggs and it's, so you want to support them the best you can and you don't have to feed them completely of, of food, um, but I, I believe that you need to supplement them so that keep them healthy. Okay, so the, the fourth question we got um, to start with was, how do you go about building a suitable coop? What materials are recommended for entrances? We've talked so much about this already that if you have a question we haven't answered yet, can you put it in the chat? And then, um, and then I can address it. So if you have a further question about coops, or can someone- Can just a real quick little thing, Amy, on that? Um, one of the things that's happened this year real quickly is that some of the commercial um, prefab coops are not available because a lot of them come from China. And I've had quite a few people convert like old dog runs. Oh yeah. Uh, they come, they're fairly inexpensive. You can find them on Craigslist and they set up a dog run and you, a lot of times they have a roof already. You can put hardware cloth on the outside of the run, put some perches in there, put a couple boxes and you've got a pretty nice little coop, so. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, that's a great idea for a, a, a easy to construct chicken run. Mm -hmm. um, can you have just one chicken? How big should the coop be per chicken? Um, I wouldn't have just one chicken. They're pretty social animals. Um, you'll see even when they get up in the morning, they like go outside together and then they hang out and scratch around together and they go in together. So I, I would think one chicken would be pretty lonely. Um, how big should the coop be per chicken? I was looking that up earlier too, and I think it depends on a lot of things. Like, are we talking about the just the hen house itself? Are we talking about the enclosed run? Do they get to go out and and uh, free range beyond that? Um, it really depends on, you know, how much do they get to move through these spaces? Um, there are many different figures you can look up online, um, but it let's see one that i saw earlier was like 10 10 square feet per chicken so if you had like if, if you if, if you're if that's like their run 10 square feet per chicken would be like if you had a you know six by seven run that's what 42 square feet um so that's great for four up to four chickens um but that's just kind of a a rule of thumb that doesn't really take into account all of the um, the many factors that you could consider when you're when you're building for your particular situation. Can I add just one thing too? Sorry ah. to inter keep interrupting, but but in terms of uh, I didn't get a video of my coop, but I made it. My coop is is um, probably 20 years old now, and we made the mistake of making this huge, luxurious walk-in chicken coop, and really um, they don't need much space inside. They need a little bit of space inside when it rains to keep them dry, to lay their eggs and to sleep. And that's about it. So I always tell people, if you're gonna, um, it's better to make a smaller house and a bigger run, because really that's where they're gonna spend most of their time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
we need to be able to, especially if it gets really cold at your house, they, they need to be able to warm that, that enclosed hen house with their body heat at night and, and stay warm. So if you have a big drafty hen house, they're going to have a harder time staying warm at night. Mm -hmm. And it's just more things to clean when they don't really need it. So yeah. <laughs> um, the next question, if we move on. Yeah. Um, how do we, how do you know when a chicken is ready to lay eggs? They need to be, and it depends on what breed it is, but they need to be anywhere between four and six months. And they need to have 12 hours of daylight. So they have to have both combos of things in order to start laying. That's why I said sometimes it's easier to raise them in the fall and then they start laying in the spring. And believe it or not, I've actually had a whole batch of chickens one day um, start laying on the, on the solstice. The day we had 12 hours of light, it was amazing. It's amazing. But um, yeah, so they have to be between four and six months and 12 hours of light. And then one thing to note too is that chickens molt, they lose all of their feathers in the fall. So you see a lot of chickens end up on Craigslist in the fall because they stop laying. They can't lay while they're losing their feathers and growing new ones. And so um, a lot of people don't realize that they stop laying. They stop laying for, because they're molting and growing their new feathers, they need fresh feathers to survive winter. When you've got clean, fluffy feathers, you stay warmer. And then the other thing is that they don't lay in the winter because there's not 12 hours of light. Uh, people ask me how we get the eggs in the store and that's because they they put artificial lights into coops um, so that chickens sort of are uh, forced into laying because they because of this 12 hours of light. And you mentioning that 12 hours that we had our coop in a place that got winter shade and we weren't getting eggs. So that's why we moved it to a sunnier corner so that they got as much sun as possible when the sun is low and we got more eggs. We got more eggs. Mm -hmm. nice. Also, uh, real quick, some of the breeds, um, it, I think I showed John that this book earlier, we, we posted this. A lot of different breeds lay different numbers of eggs. So like the, the old leghorns, that the white ones you see with the big combs, they'll lay up to 320 eggs a year. And then some roost, uh, some breeds, like there's one called, a, um, I don't know, a dorking, they lay 50 eggs per year. So it's sometimes it's a good idea to kind of see uh, how many eggs per year that breed tends to lay because they may be really pretty, but they only give you 50 eggs out of <laughs> 365. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, we had a few more questions pop up on the chat here. Um, toxic plants to avoid for chickens. Um, I will tell you my two ways of thinking about that question at home. One, and when I'm feeding them food scraps or things from my garden, I give them anything people eat. Um, so for instance, I would give them a mushy tomato but I wouldn't give them a moldy tomato. I would give them a tomato, but I wouldn't give them tomato leaves um, because I wouldn't give them the parts that people wouldn't eat either. Um, so that's one rule of thumb. I give my chickens any food scraps that people would eat, unless I know it's something they can't get their beak into, like a carrot. A uh, chicken can't eat a carrot unless it's grated or something like that because they can't get their beak into it. Um, but when I give my chickens weeds, Gail and John, you can tell me if you have a different take on this. I give them all my weeds. And I've never had a problem with chickens getting ill from any weeds because I don't necessarily know which weeds are okay to eat and which are not. And they eat almost all of them. And every once in a while they leave something and I've never had a problem. Do you two have a different take on that? I give them everything. And if I have like broccoli stem or carrots that I was going to compost, I chop them into smaller pieces so they could peck at them easier and, and get them down. I would guess the rats are coming in too, and, and we haven't really talked about rats, but chickens and rats kind of go hand in hand. So you can design a coop that's a little more rat proof. Mine's not, so from time to time we get rats. And I think that's just part of my system. So the things that I don't see the chickens eat, I think in the night other things might be coming to eat them. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah. Okay. I, always, I always tell people that um, you know chickens don't have teeth. They have a gizzard that has to grind up uh, with using rocks. And so you don't want to give them anything too big or too hard or too long. 
like that because they can't they can, they won't stand on a piece of grass and pull it apart they swallow the whole thing and that can cause some problems so it's it should be sm whatever you give them it should be chopped or smushed or cooked or you know in small pieces um we got a question what makes eggs be different colors for example light green um and that's an easy one because each breed of chicken has its own color of eggs that it lays and so that makes it really fun to plan your flock because if let's say you're going to get you're planning to have three hens you could get a white egg layer a brown egg layer and a green or blue egg layer and then you always know who laid each egg i always like to do that i get a variety of egg colors because then i i pull it out and i'm like oh this one's from bagel or this one's from smudge um and and they will always lay that same color their whole life um okay so then i'm back to the next question here oh how much time each week do you dedicate for caring for animals um well, I have a lot of other animals besides chickens, but the chicken coop itself, when I do um, it's Sunday mornings, animal chores, um, I go out there, I scrape out their, um, their house underneath their roost, um, put fresh shavings in their um, nest boxes, same thing, and fill their food, fill their water. I'm done in um, 15 minutes. Um, and, and, that's, and then every day I'm you know, letting them out and putting them back in and collecting their eggs. So it's, it's not a ton of time, but then if something needs repair or a chicken needs some special attention for something, then we have to be ready to unexpectedly spend more time with them um, than, than normal. But the, the maintenance is, you know, it's not, um, it's not a huge amount of time. It just takes like a kind of a set routine to get it done. Um, you don't want to be stuck going like, oh, I really should clean out their house a week later. Oh, I really, really should. <laughs> you just got to make it a routine and keep up with it. All right. To you, Gail, for seven? Um, ish issues with city regulations. Um, technically, it depends on which city you're in, but most cities will allow you to have six, six hens and no roosters. So that's kind of the bottom line. Some people have more um, hens. I've looked up different ordinances and it really depends on where you live. And as long as you don't go crazy, most people don't mind. And, and I think there might be something about a setback, like, like how far your chickens can be to like your neighbor's house, you know, so it depends on your neighbors. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, is there any special care chickens need to keep them happy and healthy? We've been talking a lot about that. So if you have any other specific questions about that, that would be good to just put in the chat. Of course, you can sing to them. You can sing to them. They <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you never know. There, there could be chickens that need more special care than other chickens. Um, I've had a few like that. Um, I have one chicken right now who tends to get manure stuck on the, the feathers on her back end, and so every month or two we have to trim everything on her backside um it's not her favorite or ours but she needs that um and there are other um situations in which a chicken might need more special care we remember we had a chicken up at life lab that had the big the gigantic poof on the top of its head and we always had to put it in a rubber band because she would get it into her eyeballs and get eye infections. So we, so she was a little higher maintenance than the regular chicken. So uh, somebody just popped up with a parasite question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can answer that if you want. Me too. Yeah. Um, couple, couple different things. Somebody else also mentioned diatomaceous earth in the soil. Chickens take dust baths for the most part and um, to, to uh, dry out their, the insects that are caught underneath their feathers. If you put diatomaceous earth in kind of a little um, hole in the corner where they're dusting, that will help because diatomaceous earth is, um, is silica dust and basically it, it cuts up the shells, exoskeletons of the insects. And we, you can use it in a coop too. I'm always cautious with, I tell people to be cautious because it is silica, which is glass and you don't wanna be breathing it and they don't need to be breathing a lot of it either. So you wanna be careful and not just start flinging it around. Um, there are um, 
other sort of more natural things that you can use to keep insects down. Um, and you just have to kind of wait and see what happens. Most of the times diatomaceous earth will work. There's some permethrin dust too if you get a horrible, um, the, everybody gets a um, mite infestation at one time or another and you can use different things for that depending on if you want to go organic or not. And then um, in terms of other parasites like worms and things, in the old days we used to have to worm them at least once a month. But now um, a lot of the commercial feeds are putting diatomaceous earth in the feed. And diatomaceous earth is a natural warmer that really helps. And so a lot of people don't even think about worming chickens anymore unless you're going to a chicken show and then they require you to worm them with ivermectin. But otherwise, most backyard chickens do pretty well without um, regular toxic worming. So there you go. So Gail, I'm seeing the rooster question coming up in the chat as well as on our, our original list. And maybe we should go to that. Um, okay. because a lot of the questions in between where we are and that we have answered, um, but we can always go back and hit any that we've missed. But I think that's probably one a lot of people are wondering about. Okay. Number 11 and 12. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can I, can I go back to number nine? Because somebody did have a chicken that's using feathers. That I'll just be really quick. There is a reason that it's called the pecking order. <laughs> Chickens just, they're, they're, you know, descended from little dinosaurs and they can be horrible little creatures and they tend to pick on others sometimes. Um, sometimes they all get along copacetically and that's wonderful. Um, sometimes there's a low dog, low, low chicken on the totem pole and they'll pick at it. Um, sometimes it's other chickens, sometimes they're molting. Um, the one thing that I always tell people to do is watch to make sure that they don't draw blood because chickens will then just descend on that poor chicken. And so there are medicines that you can put on them to stop other chickens from picking at them that taste really bad and also helps to disinfect any wounds. So I just um, usually tell people to keep an eye on them and also keep them busy. If they're bored, they will pick they will find somebody to pick on. So especially in the winter when they can't get out and they can't take dust best, they, they start getting bored. And that's when these kind of fun little, you know, chicken blocks and you can make little, there's all kinds of really fun things where you string popcorn and let them pick at it and jump at it. And it's just a good idea to keep them busy because otherwise they, they find ways to keep themselves busy. So um, in terms of roosters, Moving on, um, there is a 10% chance of rooster when you buy sexed chicks. When you hatch chicks, it's, it's at least 50%, if not higher. Um, a lot of times people say, well, that I'll hatch chicks and then I only end up with half roof roosters. It doesn't work that way. Um, when you buy straight run chicks, sometimes you'll end up with one rooster and sometimes you'll end up with 12 roosters out of 12. It's uh, the percentage is over the population of the chickens in the world. And the trick is, what do you do with a rooster? Um, there are, um, it, that's a tricky question. It really depends on you. And it really depends on what your, um, your tolerance for uh, what to do with a rooster is. Unfortunately, there are way more roosters in the world than, than have um, country farms homes for. Um, there are some people that will take roosters uh, that have flocks out in the country. And usually you can call a feed store or um, look on Craigslist and, and f try to find a home for them that way. Um, there are people that choose to eat them. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that either if if you can you know a lot of people just say i don't really want to eat my pet that i thought was henrietta and is now henry and that's totally understandable it's not an easy thing uh, for even for farmers who do it all the time it's not easy um, uh, there are people that will take a rooster and eat them there are plenty of people out there that are totally fine um, turning a rooster into a good meal. And so there, there's, so there's different things you can do. One is try to find a home. 
Uh, one is to find somebody that will eat them so that you don't need to deal with that. And then there are those who will um, tr try to go through the whole process themselves and eat their rooster. And then the vegetarian's dilemma, what to do with chickens when they are past laying age. There are quite a few people that will take um, old chickens. I used to have um, a big coop that I called Gail's home for aged and decrepit chickens. And I used to take a bunch of them. I don't do that as much anymore, but there are people that will do that. Um, and then there are also a lot of people who that is a delicacy in their culture um, to eat old chickens and make them into a delicious meal for their family. So, yeah. Um, can I add to that, Gail? Yeah. Um, a lot of us just keep those ladies around even when they're not laying so much anymore and they just get to be part of our flock uh, until they go. And they're still functioning as those recyclers of food scraps into manure for the compost, for the garden. Um, so they're still doing a huge part of their job, in my opinion, even when they're not laying very often anymore. Um, and so I don't mind just keeping them around. So that's one approach. And so I would recommend that you build your coop for a little bit higher numbers of chickens than you actually want to have laying hens, if that is a, a way that you want to go. So that you won't be like, oh, I only have room for four chickens, but now only two of them are laying. What do I do? Um, if you want four laying chickens, build your coop for six chickens. That's one way to do it. Thank you for mentioning that, Amy, because I have a barred rock who's 11 years old now, and she still has an egg here and there, but she's still out there. <laughs> well, I am going to close it out. We got through our questions, uh, the ones that you all posed in our registration, and the ones that were brought up during the talk. Um, I want to thank Gail and Amy for sharing their years of chicken knowledge, and know that you can always go up to Westside Farm and Feed. That Gail's co-owner there, and they have a wealth of knowledge, not just Gail, but her other family members that work there. Um, and of course, you can find everything you need if you're on the west side. And, and if you're in Midtown or South County, there's other feed stores down there, so you don't have to fight the traffic. There are resources in our town and all the supplies and expertise that you need to raise your chickens. Um, I want to remind you that as part of our Harvest Fest contributions, we're going to be nurturing yourself in nature on Wednesday the 7th, and we're going to talk about exploring local tide pools on Thursday the 8th and on Saturday the 10th in the morning. If you want to learn more about Life Lab, you can come to our free fall benefit event and hear the work we're doing, how we're adapting to this COVIDness. And thanks a lot for being here with us today. And we do have a registration of uh, a recording of this, I see that. And that's that. Thanks a lot. We'll be back in touch with the follow up of the recording. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Happy chickening. <laughs>